"'Twas the night before Christmas, when all through the house, all you could hear was a British guy still banging on about Brexit, even on Christmas Eve. Hello and welcome to another TLDR Brexit Explained video. As you already know, it's Christmas Day, which means that no one wants to be debating Brexit. But I'm talking and you're watching, so I guess that's where we are in 2020. And we're back with good reason, because yesterday, on Christmas Eve, the UK and EU confirmed they've been able to reach a deal. Now, two quick caveats before we start. Firstly, apologies, you are going to have to look at my face for quite a lot of this video. But with the announcement coming out at 3pm on Christmas Eve, we weren't able to make a fully animated video today. We didn't have time, and it wouldn't have been fair on our team who had their own Christmas plans already. Secondly, we also don't have all of the information just yet. The EU-UK deal is expected to be around 2,000 pages long, and it's not been published in full, at least at the time we're recording. Even if it were published, it's still going to take a number of days for it to receive full legal scrutiny. So anyone telling you for sure what the deal says, who's won or lost, who's been betrayed, don't listen to those people just yet. We'll see how things play out in the days ahead, but for now, no one knows for sure. If you do want to be updated as we get all of the details, then be sure to subscribe to the channel. Subscribing and hitting the bell icon not only keeps you in the loop going forward, but it's also a nice little Christmas present for us. Thanks so much for your support. Let's get started by discussing how we got to this Christmas Eve announcement, and then we can talk about the contents of the deal itself. Now, getting this trade deal was difficult. That kind of goes without saying. Despite what some people claimed pre-Brexit, this didn't end up being a walk in the park. That was at least partly because of expectation management. Brexiteer leaders had a tendency of promising the world, saying that the UK would hold all the cards, be able to keep access to EU markets while giving nothing away. Ultimately, as soon as people got round the negotiating table, it was quickly realised that this was nothing more than a fantasy. The whole point of a trade deal between any two countries is compromise, giving away some sovereignty, some national power, in order to get increased economic power and opportunity. There was always going to be a compromise, and while that might annoy some people, and might lead some to blame Johnson for capitulating, it was always an inevitability, unless you genuinely preferred a no-deal Brexit. This isn't just us blaming Brexiteer leaders, either. For sure, there were a bunch of Remain leaders that were also pretty slippery. But it was the Brexit camp that landed us in this situation, making bold claims that the Conservative government then had to work out how they could deliver, a party whose leader at the time supported Remain. Anyway, when it comes to this compromise, no issue was a bigger hold-up than fishing. The EU insisted that their boats should continue to get access to British waters, while the UK wanted to regain control of their seas. Ultimately, in recent days, it seems that this was the biggest sticking point in negotiations, with just £60 million worth of fish holding up the entire deal. As I've said on this channel a ton of times before, fishing isn't an economic issue, it's a sovereignty one. The entire fishing industry is worth less than 1% of the UK's economy, and the fact that £60 million worth of fish actually nearly held up the entire thing really shows that this argument wasn't about the economics, it was about the politics and the optics. Johnson didn't want to be seen as letting down coastal areas of the UK and giving up control. The EU didn't want to let down their fishing communities and be seen as capitulating to the UK. However, it does seem that this impasse was broken, and that the UK and EU were able to reach a deal, something that both sides were proud to proclaim yesterday afternoon. And so I'm very pleased to tell you uh, this afternoon uh, that we have completed the biggest trade deal yet, worth £660 billion a year, a comprehensive Canada-style free trade deal between the UK and the EU, a deal that will protect jobs across this country, a deal that will allow goods, UK goods and components to be sold uh, without tariffs and without quotas uh, in the EU market, a deal which will, if anything, allow our companies and our exporters to do even more business with our European friends. So it seems as though Johnson's very happy with what's been delivered. But what does the deal actually tell us? Well, as we said, we've not seen the full text just yet. So this is based on a series of EU documents that we've linked to below. Firstly, the most immediate change worth acknowledging is that the UK will lose free movement. This is something we discussed in another video, but it's inevitable that free movement for goods, services and people will all end. 
However, people will continue to have the right to travel visa-free for up to 90 days in Europe or the UK. When it comes to trade and the movement of goods though, there'll be no tariffs or quotas between the two states. Companies across both sides will be free to continue trading without any limitations when it comes to quotas or tariffs. That's not to say that trade will be completely free though. Following the 1st of January, there'll now be a bunch of new paperwork and bureaucracy when it comes to trade. So while there are no tariff barriers in place, there will be a whole bunch of non-tariff barriers, and companies shipping to Europe will still have to cover the cost and time of completing this new paperwork. Considering we started this video by talking about fish, it feels like it'll be rude to not discuss that issue pretty quickly. The agreement means that we're about to head into a five and a half year transition period, at the start of which EU vessels will maintain the current levels of access to UK waters. However, as it progresses, this access will gradually be reduced. Then when we exit the transition period in five and a half years time, the UK and EU will meet to agree on a new status quo for fishing access, fisheries management, and the best way to conserve marine resources. These meetings will be held annually and in perpetuity, so both sides can remain aligned on this issue. According to the deal, the UK will continue paying into some EU programmes, with both sides especially continuing their cooperation when it comes to research, innovation and space. This means that the UK will continue paying into and maintain access to Horizon Europe, the Eurotom Research and Training Programme, the Fusion Test Facility ITER, Copernicus, as well as the EU Satellite Surveillance and Tracking Services. However, the UK has decided not to opt in to the EU's universities programme, Erasmus, or Europe's terrorism data sharing programme. Taking Erasmus first, this means that UK students won't have access to the same programmes, allowing them to study abroad at EU universities, at least for the current time. For the crime and terrorism data sharing, the UK will no longer have direct real-time access to sensitive EU databases that support the EU's area of freedom, security and justice. In fact, these two omissions are something that the EU's chief negotiator, Michel Barnier, said that he regretted most during the EU's press conference. One of the biggest stumbling blocks during negotiations, besides fishing, which of course nearly tanked the whole deal single-handedly, was arbitration. Both sides agreed that there had to be some mechanism in place to ensure that the rules and the deal were being followed fairly. Someone who could arbitrate and step in if either side broke the rules. The EU wanted this to be the European Court of Justice, and the UK, well, the UK just didn't want it to be any European court. Sir Johnson was pleased to announce that they've reached an agreement in this area, which avoids European courts entirely. From January the 1st, we are outside the customs union and outside the single market. British laws will be made solely by the British Parliament, interpreted by UK judge, judges sitting in UK courts, and the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice will come to an end. The EU's official documentation explains that if a solution to a disagreement cannot be found between the EU and the UK, an independent arbitration tribunal can be established to settle the matter through a binding ruling. This horizontal dispute settlement mechanism covers most areas of the agreement, including level playing fields and fisheries. And that's actually one of the other areas that cause quite a lot of contention, level playing fields. Just quickly for anyone who forgot, level playing field provisions were designed to ensure that competition remained fair between both sides. They prevent one side from allowing businesses to cut costs by the government cutting standards, environmental protections, workers' rights, etc. The idea was that a common basic set of rules would be followed so that both sides could protect their businesses from unfair competition. On level playing fields, the EU report comments that both sides have committed to upholding common high standards, ensuring the protection of labour and social standards, environmental protections, the fight against climate change including carbon pricing, and tax transparency. They also say that the dispute settlement mechanism we mentioned earlier can be used to ensure that businesses from the EU and UK compete on a level playing field. The parties have the right to take unilateral action to safeguard their economies against unfair competition from the other party. And ultimately, that trade element is the most important part of this. This is a trade deal after all, and deals were supposed to be what Brexit was all about. 
In the heat of the fishing arguments, it's easy to lose sight of how important a deal really was. It's easy to say that people always wanted a no deal, but in reality, not having a deal with your closest neighbour and largest trading partner, the UK's largest by some margin, would be pretty disastrous for the UK and EU's economies, at least in the short term. So it's unsurprising that both sides were relieved to announce that a deal had been done. At the end of a successful negotiations journey, I normally feel joy, but today, I only feel quite satisfaction and, frankly speaking, relief. Anyway, that was a super quick rundown of how a deal works in the most basic terms, and we'll be diving much deeper once we get all of the details in the coming days, and when we have time to make a real video rather than me just sitting down and doing this. So be sure to subscribe to be updated when we release that. We've also set up a poll on our Patreon page to find out which Brexit questions you want answering most. Anyone signed up paying $3 or more can donate, so if you're not a Patreon yet, be sure to sign up and have your say. Anyway, Merry Christmas to you all, and I have mince pies to get back to, so let me just quickly thank our Patreon backers who make videos like this one possible. And if you want to see your name at the end of videos, then you too can back us on Patreon. The link to that's in the description.